So hello everyone, Salam Alaikum from our offices in Master City Abu Dhabi. My name is Erica Linton from Sustainable Action and I would like to wish everyone a very warm welcome to this live webinar, Introduction to the Circular Economy. So this is our first webinar in our webinar series that we will be hosting once a month throughout the year. And we are of course very excited to have you all joining us as we know how valuable your time is. We're also very glad to have a truly global webinar today with people joining from all around the world and our speakers are joining from the UK and Greece. As this might be the first time participating in a webinar for some of you, I would like to start by briefly introducing how this session will work. So this is the live webinar and while you are able to hear us, we will not be able to hear you. However, our webinar is designed to be interactive with live interaction throughout the session. So we do encourage you to participate by writing questions and comments at the bottom of your control panel, where you should be able to find a chat box. Questions and comments can be posted at any time during the webinar, and the questions will be answered in the end during the Q&A session. If you would like to address a specific question to a specific panelists, please do mention that so we know who the question is for. We very much look forward to hearing from you so that you can be engaged with the panelists and also with each other. So please go ahead and post as many questions or comments as you like, as we really hope this will be a interactive session. I would also like to remind you about our hashtag GoCircularGCC that we encourage you to use for any social media postings regarding this webinar. So during this session, we also have a few voting questions for you that we would appreciate if you could answer. To try this out, I'm now going to post the first question for you to vote on. So the question is, do you need a holiday? Please go ahead and select yes or no and click the submit button. All right, so let's see the results. 67% of you says you need a holiday and a few people apparently just maybe came back from holiday. So that's how it works. Um, now that we know how it works, I'm gonna go straight ahead and ask the next question. So which elements of sustainability does your organization prioritize? Please select social, environmental, or if it's not applicable for you, you can choose that and submit the answers. Okay, so result is 9% says social elements, and 73 environmental elements. Thank you very much. We will have a few more voting questions for you a bit later on. So as an introduction to sustainability to action, we are a sustainability consultancy based in Abu Dhabi and London. And we wanted to start this webinar series really to share our sustainability knowledge and provide leading edge sustainability content. So today's topic, we're very excited about uh, the circular economy, which is fast becoming accepted as much needed progression from the linear economy. Uh, as global consumption increases and the hunger for materials to support growth mean that innovation and radical progress are required to support demand. So much of the focus in recent years has really been on reducing waste and increasing recycling. And the need is now to apply circular economy principles in, is uh, increasingly pressing. So for this reason, we're holding the webinar on circular economy, economy to raise the topic and encourage more conversation, thinking and debate around this subject. So the agenda for today we will start with uh, Sandra Nani, who is the Director of Sustainability Action, will provide us an introduction to the circular economy. 
and thereafter Tia Kansara, director of Kansara Hackney, will talk about different perspectives of the circular economy. Then we have a panel discussion followed by the Q&A session. And as I mentioned, although the Q&A session is not until the end, I would like to remind you that you can post your questions at any time during this webinar. So we do have two excellent speakers today. Sandra Nani, Director of Sustainability to Action, is a recognized sustainability and policy expert with over 19 years of experience. She has dedicated her career to sustainable development and communications and is currently preparing a research proposal in application for her PhD on sustainability. Her diverse career has been complemented by her ongoing commitment to academic development, including a MBA in international business management from the University of London. Our second fantastic speaker is Tia Kansara, who is an award-winning entrepreneur, lecturer and author. She's the founder and director of Kansara Hackney, the first sustainable life cycle consultancy in the UK. She did her PhD at University College London Energy Institute on designing future cities and energy evaluation in the Gulf. Her recent work involved providing city governments with her concept replenish, a per capita assessment of eco ecosystems, services and publishing her first book with the same name, Replenish. And you will find the bios of the speakers in the handout section of this webinar. So now I would like to extend a warm welcome to our first speaker, Sandra Nani, Director of Sustainability Action. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I would like to add my welcome to Erica's. We're delighted to have you join our webinar today. Um, and we hope to invite to provide you with information and knowledge on how to steer towards a more sustainable future. As you will be aware, uh, companies are increasingly under pressure to transform to a more sustainable business model. And our series of webinars are designed to help you and support you through that journey by sharing, challenging and collaborating with you on how a responsible business can make the transition and whilst doing so, make a positive change in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start with a brief introduction of Sustainability to Action. Uh, we are a niche sustainability consultancy based in Abu Dhabi uh, in the UAE, uh, uh, but we also have a base in the UK. So um, we have extensive uh, access to local and international sustainability expertise, uh, which we would love to support you with. Uh, here is just a, a brief intro to some of the work that we can support you with and we very much hope to collaborate and work with you uh, on, on some of your uh, brilliant uh, sustainability projects as you go forward. So as I said, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the first Sustainability to Action webinar. Um, I would encourage you to not only feel inspired by this session, but also to tweet along using hashtag GoCircularGCC you will hopefully see through our um, uh, Twitter account that we have been using this uh, hashtag. You can search it and you can see and you can add your own comment. Um, as uh, Erica very kindly introduced me, uh, I'm, uh, I'm humbled by that. Uh, so you have an idea of who I am. And today our webinar is not only just any webinar, but during this session we're going to be talking about how we harness the power of business to resolve economic, environmental, and social challenges. We're going to look at opportunities on how we can profoundly transform our economy and move to a more circular model, uh, model that is regenerative and restorative by design. So um, we're going to look at some examples between myself and uh, Tia's excellent presentation. And so in the next 45 minutes or so, we will be discussing the opportunities and barriers of a circular economy. So, um, looking at um, a circular economy, um, we've been tweeting this information, and it's, it's not a secret, but it is a shocking fact that 80% of the products that we all buy are consumed, used, uh, and within six months of being purchased, go to landfill. So, when we want to think about um, why people should go circular and what's the drivers for a circular economy, we currently at the moment, the economy that we live in um, is, is encouraging the consumerist behavior, which is uh, a system that is about take, make, and dispose. There's a number of elements that are not helping us to build a more sustainable economy. Those include 
confusion. So um, people are confused. So even when you want to do recycling, you're faced with challenges with the product itself. You don't. So the, not all manufacturers list what their um, products contain. So it's difficult for you to guess: is this plastic, or is this recyclable, or what kind of a metal is this, or or is this toxic? So. So sometimes there's quite a few things that are confusing. So we're not helping ourselves with the current system, which is known as the linear system, and we'll go into that in the next slide. But these are some of the reasons that are driving us to go towards a more circular thought uh, and system. Um, so these are challenges that face all of us as consumers and as businesses even, and we face this on a daily basis. And currently, really, this indicates that the current system is broken and um, the take, make, dispose economy system really needs to uh, change. So this is us as a consumer looking a bit confused. Do I recycle this? Do I put, send it to the landfill? I wanted to share with you a few uh, definitions from thought leaders on, on uh, uh, the circular economy. And if you haven't done so already or if you haven't heard of them already, we would strongly recommend to you that you look them up. One is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, to whom we are deeply indebted for all of the knowledge that they have already shared with us on the circular economy. Uh, they provide a, um, a, a definition on what the circular economy is. And in their minds, uh, this is how they've shared it with all of us, is a circular economy is restorative and regenerative by design. It aims to keep products, components, and materials at their highest utility and value at all times, which really sounds lovely and holistic. Um, there's also RAP. I would recommend that you have a look at RAP. They are a fantastic organization who specialize in how um, to uh, reduce waste and um, build a more uh, a circular economy. Um, and so they have an, an, their own definition as well, which is moving from the traditional linear economy uh, and then trying to make the maximum value of resources and extracting as least as possible from the earth. Wanted to, um, sorry, before we move to the next slide, we wanted to share with you a, a short video, if you'll bear with us. Um, it's a very interesting video, uh, one that I really love, and it's called The Impossible Hamster. I hope you enjoy it. From birth to puberty, a hamster doubles its weight each week. If it didn't stop when mature, as animals do, and continue to double on its first birthday, it would be staring at a nine billion ton hamster. This hamster could eat all of the corn produced annually worldwide in a single day and still be hungry. There is a reason why, in nature, things grow in size only to a certain point. So why do most economists and politicians think that the economy can grow forever and ever? Well, we hope you enjoyed that. That I'm, I'm very, very in love with that hamster, even though he's very enormous and he's not sustainable. But then this is also another good resource for you, the um, uh, NEF website. Uh, you can look them up and Google them. You can see the impossible hamster for yourself. There's a, a lot of content and uh, material that they've uh, developed to promote these ideas. Uh, so moving back to our... Um, um, to our presentation, um, we just mentioned and touched on briefly uh, the circular economy and what we mean by today's uh, traditional linear economy. So um, what that means really is um, once we take, today's economy really essentially is one where we take resources from the earth, we turn them into a product, we buy the product, we use it for a little while and then we throw it away and it goes to a landfill as you can see in this diagram. 
with a, and every new product depends on a finite resource. There's only so much that we can extract from our earth. And that means also that the way this economy works, there is an enormous amount of waste and inefficiency that is built into the system. And the waste is structural. So we'll give you a couple of examples here, and these are, again, commonly known uh, examples. Houses. So houses are empty. Most houses... Uh, there are many more empty houses in the European Union and the United States than there are homeless people. And how many homeless people have we seen out there? So that, that's one way of looking at how our economy is a bit wasteful. Um, we have empty houses when there is a real social need for those houses. And then we also, you can look at the more traditional um, concept of cars, uh, where we, you know, I think every one of us is safe to assume has at least one car. Um, uh, the facts around cars is that 92% of the time cars are parked. So they're not actually, the point of a car is to take you from one place to another. But in reality, 92% of the time of that car is parked. So it's not fulfilling its function and its purpose at 100% uh, of the time or even near that. Uh, and 50% of cities infrastructure is dedicated to streets and roads. So these are just some interesting st statistics to get you thinking about the traditional linear economic system that we have at the moment. And so the problem is compounded because most solutions, and this is a real issue, are trying to deal with the results or they're trying to deal with the waste at the end of this process of this linear economy. And you're not going to be able to come up with a solution just by dealing with the waste. And so one directional linear system and thinking is increase, increasingly under pressure because it's not sustainable. So um, on this slide, to compound the matter, so we've looked at how the linear economy works uh, very quickly because I'm aware of my time as well. Um, the, um, the, there is a global economic... Uh, sh shift that's going on. Um, and if we look at uh, today's economic system and uh, pressures, um, what we'll find is that there are various market forces that are also telling us that we need to change and we need to rethink our system. So there's a pressure on the system in terms of production uh, and uh, manufacturing. So when we look at commodity price volatility, what this means is that there's uh, a lot of products that depend on finite resources and those resources are becoming increasingly scarce. We burn through them at a, a very fast pace, which is not sustainable. When we look at the demographic changes, there's a population growth. So it's expected or anticipated that by 2050 there will be 9 billion people living on this planet all of them demanding more, more goods and more purchase and more consumerism. So also anticipated that by 2030 there will be 3 billion new middle class consumers because the um, people are becoming more economically uh, wealthy and they have more disposable income, they will want to spend more. So these are going to increase by 3 billion by 2030. So you can imagine the demand and how, how much more demand will grow. So um, but we're also having some things such as, which, which are positives really, the, the, the two bullets on the bottom of the slide are about changing consumer attitudes so, and technological innovation. So if we, we all know all about the technology, 3D printing, big data, the Internet of Things, these things are facilitating product and material tracking, and they're also enabling innovative financing, mobility, and sharing of solutions. They're also allowing uh, system effectiveness and revealing... Let me have a look. Oh, sorry, my phone is talking to me. <laughs> so, um, just so, uh, fostering system effectiveness by revealing and designing out any negative externalities that are related. So, um, if we look at, this is known as the uh, butterfly diagram, and this is how the global economy is slowly changing. So through practical building blocks, when we look at it, um, we need radical design, which is about designing for recovery, 
So we design the product so that we can actually restore 100% of the resource we've put in it, whether it's a t-shirt or a car or whatever it might be. We need to look at innovative business models, how new business models see the consumer as a user, right? And they offer um, a performance contract or they incentivize that consumer to, to bring back or share their product. So that's looking at how new business models can start. And they've already started. You, you will have all seen uh, different ways of, and platforms where people are sharing, whether it's Uber, etc. And I'm being told that my time is up, so I will move very quickly. Um, so this is uh, just to give you an idea about how the economy needs to close the loop and stop sending things to the landfill and, and keeping all the resources within the, the economy and reusing them. Um, so, I, so, so how can we do that very quickly? Um, one organization can't do it on its own, bearing in mind, and we need to look at how we preserve and enhance natural capital. We need to optimize resource yields by circulating uh, products, components, and materials at all times, technically and biologically, so we, we have those two loops. And um, what I wanted to close with is um, a little survey here, which I think I'll hand over to Erica to launch, a little poll. Yes, thank you very much, Sandra. So now we would like to hear you, ladies and gentlemen, who do you think should be responsible for implementation of the circular economy? So the options are government and policymakers, businesses, individuals, or the community. Please go ahead and vote. Okay, thank you. So we can see that 33% of you said government and policymakers, 11% said businesses, 33% individuals, and some of you, 22% said the community. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, I, I hope that that gave you a very quick whirlwind tour of the circular economy versus the linear and where we're at. Um, we would welcome you to join us on our uh, various platforms. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our next speaker, Tia. Uh, Very Tia exciting. Now. Yes, sorry Tia, I seem to have dropped uh, through. Um, right, so I was just going to introduce you very quickly. Thank you very much everyone. Uh, Tia Kinsara, uh, we're very grateful to have you on board with us today. Thank you for joining us. Tia is an award-winning entrepreneur, moderator, lecturer and author. She uh, has the first sustainable lifestyle consultancy in the UK and she did her PhD at University, University College London. Um, we welcome you today, Tia, and uh, we really look forward to linking with you. Uh, hi, everybody. I am uh, very grateful for this opportunity to have a chat with you about a topic that for me has been really incredible. Um, I think. Um, what has been sort of the biggest challenge up until now has been uh, why should we do any of this? Like, what what's the, the sort of the uh, the reason for any of this actually taking place? Um, and I think what's really fascinating is that um, if we if we just take a look at just the different steps. I mean, and I'd really like the opportunity to kind of mention some of my own personal steps in this in this area that um, we can actually identify certain key points and key um, stages or key moments that, that we've had to make these shifts. And I think what's from, from 25,000 years of human history, it's only really in the last uh, maybe 100 or 200 years that we've been able to accelerate our ability to collaborate, our ability 
to, to share our knowledge and, and to grow from one another's experiences and, and really to, to delve quite deep into the kind of questions that we can ask. And so what, uh, what, what I've, I've been working on is a concept called replenish, which I feel very uh, strong towards. And uh, the reason for that is that replenish itself does not have a particular um, does not have a, a, a particular sort of mode yet. What it is is a philosophy, and I think what's uh, the, the reason why I'm introducing this as a philosophy is because if we look at um, our economic system today, the end result is what we see on the screen. The end result is islands of waste that are floating around in the Atlantic Ocean, and as much as this isn't very nice to see. This is my visual inspiration when I walk down the streets of India, and actually it's not just India, uh, what is called a third world country, but also parts of England that one would consider a developed, advanced um, economy. And what's uh, in in kind of understanding where we've got to, all the different steps, if we, if we were to go back and reverse through the different steps that we've taken in order for us to be at the place that we are today, we can almost identify areas that that haven't worked. And I think this is really a case of uh, reflection as a community, as a nation, as you know, a global economy, to reflect on what does and does not work, um, what works for, for businesses, what works for communities, what works for um, individuals uh, that are consuming um, and on a, on a broader scale business that, that can provide the kind of value that is required uh, for all the different stakeholders to be, to be part of that uh, value generation. And so I'd like to define what replenish really is. Replenish is the act of giving back more than you're taking. That's the philosophy that it's based on. Because at the moment, in all of the textbooks, if you read anything about economics, it will be economics is the scarcity of resources, is the study of the scarcity of resources. And this is, I suppose, the philosophy that that current economics has been based on. The fact that everything is scarce, and so because everything is scarce, you've got to price it up according to the scarcity of it. And depending on this, the, the price according to the scarcity of it is what we would then purchase and, and share. So economics is a scarcity of resources, which then actually makes you question um, what, what, does, what does this sort of scarcity model uh, suggest? Um, it's it's like um, you know what what can we what can we do in particular to understand how much to give back? So every time um, you look at the sort of the metrics of what what um, uh, success is in terms of the economy, one of the things that we look at is GDP across domestic product and one of the key ingredients of that is expenditure where we spend our money so I really started to reflect on this question of well of course all of the products that we have that are out there and if they do yes end up in landfill sites or you know uh, shipped out to sea buried underground um, you know rocketed to the to the depths of space all of these are solutions that we've found uh, from the expenditure that we have so whatever we buy is is then resulting in, in that form of rubbish. And then for us to, to have the psychological slant on how we manage um, the sort of identity of space and waste. And and so there are lots of different ways of, of approaching this topic from an urban planning perspective, a business perspective, um, a kind of um, design perspective. And so what circular economics, um, in, in particular for myself, does is to understand how much of the system can actually change from a systems perspective and how much of that system can we actually reinvent or what can we, what can we tweak. It's almost like a system tweaking. Two, uh, or versus what do we just fundamentally take apart and just start again. And so circular economics for me is really about starting again and replenishes the philosophy from which we have a, a moral uh, principle towards the economic growth of, of, our, of our global um, global nation. And so to define that, um, the key challenges that we've experienced have been um, something close to 80 to 85% of our built environment, as if I take the example of the built environment, um, 
is is already in place and and potentially in the next 20 or 30 years it's not going to disappear so it's still going to be there say by the age of uh, the year 2050 or 2030 so if it's still going to be there we really have to do something better um with what we've got and if we've we have these challenges, what can we do from both a, a sort of um, a renovation perspective but also a preventative perspective and I take health into consideration here as well because in health we've got you know you could either um, once you've you know there are steps that you can identify before you get ill and so whatever steps you take to stop yourself get, getting ill um, are the preventative measures and then you get ill let's say um, and then you want to take some things that can help you uh, to heal yourself from having, you know, um, almost kind of like stepped over that boundary of prevention. And so there is that sort of fine balance between the, what we can do to prevent it and what we can do um, to actually uh, deal with what we have in front of us. And so what we're, what we're dealing with here is actually a psychological shift. And that psychology um, also filters into the narrative of design it filters into the narrative of what finance means. Uh, it, it filters into the narrative or, or communication of who we are and what we want to, what, what we want our relationship to be with the environment. And so that's the sort of the the broader perspective um, of, of this philosophy. And I think um, we're at an incredible opportunity right now to challenge what we have right now in our economy and to to outline certain areas that we can develop. So um, the the company that I'd started, Kansara Hackney Limited, was really to combine uh, community architecture, circular economics and, and ecosystem service. And ecosystem service is, is the idea that if, um, let's say, a plant in, in the duration of its life could actually provide something for the environment, the biosphere, what was it specifically as um, as a resource? as its input, as its service, that we could calculate and say a tree in its life provides this much to the environment. And so ecosystem service really goes into quite a lot of depth about what is uh, appropriate for um, the environment and how we can actually provide an ecosystem service ourselves by our purchases. I'll go into a little bit more detail a little bit later on. Then you've got the circular economics that Sandra kindly um, uh, introduced to us. and then. One stage further is the kind of environment that we're living, um, X percentage of, of our societies living in cities and they're much more attractive for people to live an economically viable life. And so there, are, if I take India as an example, there's approximately 450 million people moving from rural to urban areas in the next 40 years. And that's a lot of people that put a lot of strain on cities that are not designed uh, for, for that amount of people. And if you go to Turkey, Istanbul, if you go to London, if you go to Dubai, you'll also experience cities that are overgrown and are, are sort of just about holding on in there with um, not enough uh, routes or uh, public transport or anything else. It's almost as if the body of the city is, is, is obese and is growing way over the ability that the organs have to, to help it survive. So the challenge is, if with community architecture, is to kind of develop something of um, of a method going forward. What's the best way that we can leverage this living in harmony with nature in the cities and the luxury that we want to be able to live with, but also for it to be economically viable? And they're the kind of the three big challenges that I see in circular economics. How do we how do we um, manage these three things, aside from you know our own uh, psychological and conscious states of, of development. So I think going forward, um, I'd like to show you the um, the sort of the steps that have been taken up until now, but both for myself, but also the sort of challenges that I that I understand have been a big issue for um, a big issue for the contribution that individuals can make, and and really where our challenge lies. And I think where we are, um, where where we are is, um, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, where we are is the ability to um, is to to map out um, our real challenge. And I think sustainability as a whole, at the minute, really has um, the kind of the definition slightly wrong. Um, and the the reason why I say that is because 
if we sustain the status quo, the status quo currently is not really worth sustaining. And so to identify a complete shift, we have to move away from the sustainability of the status quo today. And that's where I wanted to make a distinction between what we have right now and, and what our challenge is. Our challenge is a fundamental sustain, uh, a system shift. Um, can I have the, the next slide? Yes. Um, so investing um, on an individual scale, so let's say we were to take this expenditure value in, in the, the basic uh, gross domestic product um, equation, would look at what is it that we spend our money on that has now led to the end result of all of this waste in the environment. If we can understand what we're investing in, every time I go to the supermarket, I spend maybe uh, on 20 products, I come back home, what, what are these 20 products? And what has the the system before, during, and after my use of this product related to this um, wasting in the environment? So I take a purchase. I, I purchase an, a product. I have a particular diet. So I look at my preferences in the ingredient list. I buy it according to my particular diet, and I put it into my shopping trolley. I purchase it. I use it, and then the end result is where do I put this item? And so if you follow the route of this item, you'll get to understand how it was made, what it's being used for, and what the end result is. And if we can map out all of the different challenges that we have and align it with the moral compass of, say, replenish or the systemic change, we can actually understand where the challenges really are. So if I take, let's say, um, a simple product like bread, if I take this product of, of bread, what I'm understanding is I take this one thing and I then relate it back to the infrastructure that is available for me to, to replenish this item such that people who are designing this product already have the end in mind. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So where you spend your money is effectively the economy that has been created. Next slide, please. If I were to, to map out what it is that, that we have um, available to us and the opportunities, I take business as, um, as a huge benefit. The reason being is that these challenges not only look at um, the circular economics as a whole, as an identity, but the actual design of products, to make them more beneficial for a sustainable future. So if we were to take a television, it's not, I mean, this concept of, the Greek concept of competition, I'm in Greece at the moment, I'm in Athens, the Greek concept of competition has two forms, two definitions. The first is agonismos and the second is sin agonismos. Agonismos is c competing um, to, against each other effectively and sin agonismos is to collaborate to make a better something. So we co collaborate, we compete with one another to make a better product. In products, for example, it's not the fact that you want to take away the chances of, an, uh, of a business making money. You want to improve the chances through the research and development of this product that they would have a better product in the end for um, you know something that can be readapted to or, or uh, reconstructed, uh, re reconstructed or disassembled for um, a more sustainable use of it afterwards but actually in the actual business model to factor in where the challenges are and what you can do with these and that sort of mapping out the whole sort of sequence is going to be a real interesting way of going about this. Next slide, please. Um, what I've done is actually mapped out three specific areas, and these are the sort of three strategies that I have. Next slide, please. Um, the three strategies are short-term, medium-term, and long-term. In the short-term, to give you some examples, to, to be mindful of where you put your money, because it's an investment in a future economy, to buy items that don't end up waste heat, and to be mindful of what kind of infrastructure there is in place right now and what the opportunities are, say, for policymakers to create that infrastructure to capture that waste and not uh, for it to be a waste but um, a resource. Technologies that we have at the minute that we can actually share a lot of the assets that we have, very similar to the way that you know these empty homes have now been used with Airbnb. Next slide, please. The sort of midterm opportunity that we have is to foster this sort of serendipity, create these platforms like cities that allow us citizens 
policy makers and businesses to have these opportunities in place. So what kind of physical environments do we have that can help us do that? Third, um, long term, next slide please, is really about sort of supporting that biodiversity, understanding what relationships there are. Because in, in nature, if you went to a forest, you're not exactly going to have um, the, you know, the environment or the forest put every, all of its waste into a black bag and leave it outside. It reabsorbs it somehow. Of course, we're not going to be as uh, at full employment as uh, natural systems are, but as close to that would be our biggest challenge, but also opportunity. Next slide, please. Um, something about my research and, and sort of looking at a, the kind of the uh, waste results, um, wa waste of, of energy, um, is to kind of map out the waste um, in energy in buildings. And the amount of fuel that is used for air conditioning is something close to 70% of the building itself. And so I've mapped out some of the different opportunities that we have in looking at the research of these buildings and where we have opportunities to kind of shift them. These are current buildings, they already exist. And because of the amount of cooling that we have in steady state environments, we can actually map out which areas inside the building don't need to be cooled to the same extreme. And what I found is with one degree uh, reduction in cooling, we can have a huge impact. Can I have the next slide, please? And in these uh, sort of the diagram that you see right now with the green areas are these circulation transitional zones that we can actually reduce the electricity consumption of or the waste energy that actually ends up going outside. So that's kind of um, a quick uh, run through from me. Um, the next slide is, is a quote that I'm very fond of. Um, and, and, and all the sustainability goals that, that I love a lot. And this is sort of 2015, the 25th of September when the, the sort of broad intergovernmental agreement between these member states of the United Nations came together to suggest different ways, different methods um, that we can really transform the economy. And, and they, they range from absolute wicked problems that don't have one individual solution to, to one thing that can really be the priority for nations. So um, now the next slide is, is my uh, favorite um, quote, and that is that um, it really is a contribution that we can all make, and it's not just an individual. Often we get lost in the, the you know, but what is the impact that I can make on an individual scale? If we were to take the, everybody having a very small impact, that could have a huge impact on the environment and a shift towards a more circular economy. So that's it from, from me. Um, we welcome all of your questions. I think this is um, a great opportunity for you to ask all the questions that you like, whether it, they are sort of simple or more complicated in nature. Um, we'd really appreciate some of your reflections on, on our webinar, some of the, the things that we've, we've presented to you. Um, we haven't been able to go into as much detail, but as a sort of um, a broad spectrum, would love your thoughts on that. Over to you, Sandra. Thank you very much, Tia. Your presentation was extremely inspiring and gives us a lot of food for thought. Um, as per our agenda, which I'll stick to for now, uh, but I would also like to remind everyone, please do post your questions in the questions area in your control panel. Um, and we will be picking those up. We've already received a few, which we'll go through. But I will start with our panel discussion, if that's OK. Um, all right. So um, Tia, can I just ask you a quick question? Um, why do we need a circular economy? I know it's, it's an obvious question, but maybe if we can consolidate that. I think um, what, what uh, from my perspective of the circular economy is an opportunity to, to shift a system that isn't working. So the circular economy is one option. I'm sure of many that will arrive in the future, but the most viable one at the, at the present moment in time. Thank you. That's a very good point. Yes, so it is definitely time for a change, and there are so many indicators, not even going into the environmental climate change impacts that we see all around us on a day-to-day basis now. Um, so here's an interesting question, which is around um, what are the key challenges to the circular economy, and how could we possibly overcome those? Is that sort of an open uh, question to everybody or, or to me? To, to you, Tia, to you, ah, and then right. I'll, so, I'll also have a go at it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think the key challenges are to identify what the benefits are for everybody. 
So let's get real. I've got £20 in my pocket. I want to go to the supermarket. I want to go and buy some apples and some other fruits and vegetables. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, responsive to the amount of money that I have and also the opportunities that I have to buy something that is in, in line with my diet. If, for example, I have, a, you know, a, a vegetarian diet, I'm going to find vegetarian food. But if, for example, um, there were a diet very similar to the way that I purchased my food, but a diet that was in tune with sustainability or replenish, let's say, you know, you lived a replenished one lifestyle, you could actually go in there and, and, and identify those items that you could buy that were in tune with, with you know, your diet to replenish. And I think that's the biggest challenge that consumers have. But the benefit is for, for companies and, and um, various sort of uh, not-for-profits or, or social businesses to identify those products, make it much easier for us as consumers to find those kind of products as quickly as possible to have a brand that really makes it very simple, like the Soil Association or the Vegan Society symbol that you could actually see that, hey, this is a product that I know that has been mapped out correctly, uh, that has the standards and the, the, the quality behind it, it's assured, it's validated. And so from a consumer perspective, I want to understand that. On, on a sort of like a, a business level, and this is something that is very, very dear to me, is this whole concept of, of what kind of questions should I be asking? How can we design our products with asset recovery in mind. How can we design it so that our customers can cooperate with it, so that we can get the feedback that we require to make our product a better product, but also to, for it to be in tune um, with the revenue model that we need to have to protect our value and, and up and down the chain. Um, where do we resource uh, where do we source our materials from? Like, the, what are the regenerative loops rather than linear flows? How can we develop product lines to meet demand without wasting these assets? I mean, if you look at, at, at some of the products, I mean, I was in uh, Latin America and I had a lot of chocolate. And actually, in, in one of the shops that I visited, there were the cocoa shells. Now, I've been to the farms where uh, cocoa, um, cocoa nuts are sort of taken out. I had the, for an hour or two, I actually experienced it taking out the beans and then putting the beans in and roasting them, etc. So I've seen the whole uh, the kind of like whole process and, and in that what was really fascinating for me is that those shells can be used as tea. I this could be used for tea. If you look in you know the Middle East and uh, bazaars and markets you can see olive uh, olives that you know that the sort of waste products is made into scrubs or soaps or oils or all of these different products. And I think What's really exciting is how to innovate what we think is waste, but is actually resource. If you look at the, um, the, the sort of policymakers, yeah. If you look at um, the example of, of Japan, when I when I first moved to Japan, I had no idea that you had to segregate the waste, and I had a calendar that was put under my my door, but I didn't read Japanese at the time. So I read it, and I thought maybe it's just um, you know it's just a kind of advert. Threw it in the bin two weeks later and me having put all of my waste into one bag and put it outside. I'm ashamed to say that two weeks later my bag was still there and hadn't been collected. I was not aware that that was my bag. I just thought, oh, isn't that horrible? Somebody's bag is outside. But I then got a polite letter underneath my door that said, this is the calendar that we follow. Now please segregate your waste according to the pickup days. I took that bag. It was two weeks old. It will be a lesson forevermore. I took out every item, I segregated it, I put it out on the day that the calendar had said. It taught me something really important, that this system that I've walked into has taught me how to behave. So policymakers, you know, local councillors, whatever, local communities, it's about identifying what you want to create as a system that other people rely on and adapt to. What's the system that you would like to make? If you want us to segregate our waste, put systems into place to do that. I had a lesson. My penalty was to take a two-week-old bag of rubbish and take it apart, and it was gross, and to, to do what I had to do, because that was my penalty that I paid for not having followed that that system. Wow. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, I mean, I'll what just have learning. my hands. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough lesson to learn, but well done. <laughs> and thank you for sharing it. Um, I'll just give have a little go at it myself, and then I think questions coming through which we'll take after that. Uh, and from, from my perspective, really looking at the key challenges to the circular economy and how we could potentially overcome them, really I think there are some practical steps that need, we need to take, but we also need to 
be aware of the fact that implementing a circular economy is not a question of a decision that you can just take and implement immediately. It takes years of planning and it takes infrastructure support. Um, and um, there are some practical steps that we should take. One of them involves design and radical design of products and services, looking at how those services and products can be built in a way that they can be used longer and once their preliminary use is finished that they can be used again in a different form and have an extended life cycle. Uh, the second thing I was thinking we could also look at is uh, how business models can innovate which is what we talked about in the butterfly diagram which is moving from a business model where we see the consumer uh, where we see the consumer as the one person who uses it into actually a user who um, uses the item in a more shared way um, and um, uses it when they need it and returns it when they don't need it so other users can use the same product uh, and extend its life and allow it to, to fulfill its purpose like we said the car right in the example earlier. Uh, the other um, uh, basic building block could be reverse logistics and it's looking at collection systems so that when people, when products are at their end, there is a, a clear and easy way for people to recycle or wh whatever they need to do with the product. And then finally, I think the really important subject which you and ITA had discussed before uh, when we were preparing for this webinar was around how do we enable cross-sector, uh, cross-cycle performance through um, collaboration between stakeholders and that would mean policymakers and government but that would also be individuals um, as well as business um, and I think this kind of gives a really nice segue to some of the questions that um, we are receiving from our audience. Um, so at which point, um, Erica, can I hand over to you to read out the questions we have received? Yes, sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much, everybody, for being so active with your questions. So we will try. We have a few minutes left to answer them, so we will try to answer as many as we can. Uh, so we have one question for specifically for you, Tia. Uh, can you tell us which are the main reluctances for companies, governments, and customers to not fully go to circular economy models? I think, um, I mean, just, just thinking out loud, it's availability. If I go to a shop and I have a specific diet and you don't have my food, what do I purchase? I'm, I'm reduced to what is, what is available. And I, and I think that for a consumer is actually quite disheartening. So I'll push, I'll push, I'll push, and then I get to a point where I don't want to push anymore. And so it's really, from a consumer perspective, not just to learn what is out there and for companies to make it obvious what is, but also to, to kind of be curious. Um, what, what is my diet? You know, like what, what works with my body? What works with my replenished compass? And that, I think that's what it really is. Like what works for me and where can I find it? And for companies to make it obvious where those items are. I think the challenges for like how... Uh, governments are reluctant is is that these are long-term products they have to put into place and often they don't have the feedback quick enough to find out if it was worthwhile. They've got the money and they can spend that money on, on like a 40-year product which could bear fruits in 40 years time or, or concurrently but they're going to pick the low-hanging fruits and for many of them they're like the quick fixes in the time that the, the duration that they are in uh, in office and so if they have these low-hanging fruits made obvious to them, such as companies, maybe or consumers, coming and suggesting that this is these are the things that we would like, and these are the things that we would like them, uh, these are the things that we would like done, and I think that is the force of the community. That is the force of the community coming forward to suggest, and then having a platform upon which those suggestions can be made. There are some apps. If you look at three one one two Palo Alto app. Uh, Changeify in London. So these apps are kind of opportunities for young startups, entrepreneurs, or businesses to look at engaging the public, engaging uh, consumers to identify what is wrong with the system that they have, and and to uh, to, to notify the um, the government on or local council about some things. So if I take the example of Palo Alto, if you're um, if you're walking down the street and something's broken, take a photograph upload it onto the platform and then 
after you've uploaded it, because it's got your unique signature, so they know who, who you are, they'll follow it and you'll follow where the project is at the moment. So perhaps a drain is broken on the floor and it's making a right mess on the floor. So you've taken a photograph, you've uploaded it. You then see that the drain photograph is showing you that now it's at this stage, the different stages before it gets fixed. You're then notified where, it, firstly it's transparent, the whole process is transparent, so you know what's happening with it if you if you get curious. But at the end, it tells you and notifies you that, hey, we've sorted it, and this is what you can see right now. So the whole process is made much more transparent. So transparency, availability. Now with companies, I think the biggest challenge is, is, is change. Oh, but it's never been done before. Is it ever going to work? I think business has a great opportunity right now to, to shift a mentality of what can be done, can-do mentality. That's where innovation comes in. I might invent a light bulb, but I might not know how to innovate it. I might start a community of people, but I don't really know how to make the best out of this. And it really takes a certain kind of person who's curious about what can we do with the inside of an olive? I mean, really, what do you do with this? Can you create an energy? Can you, you know, what, what uh, can this be used as, um, as some sort of... Uh, um, a cog in a system that, that, that would work, where do you use it? And that's, that's where curiosity comes in. And then you need for that to be nurtured. So that's you've got all of these unreasonable institutes and accelerators, Y combinators, etc., springing up because the youth are uh, in many ways uninhibited by the system because they don't necessarily live that yet. They're not bogged down by some of the challenges that we've faced in, in our lives. And I think that really leads us to one of the next questions, which is, with the majority of the population uh, being youth and children in, in your part of the world, what can um, what can we teach children to go beyond the typical cycles of reduce, reuse, recycling, and and to kind of shift towards that giving back way more? And I think that that is where um, some very key points need to be made to children, and for it to be applicable to the language. Uh, There's something that I learn in in coaching, and that is that. You have to meet people where they are with their consciousness. You cannot expect, you can't imagine like a grandfather coming to a, a, a five-year-old and telling them, you're not doing this, right? There is a certain amount of nurturing that is involved. There is a certain amount of creativity that is involved. And, and there's help involved. There's resources involved. Where are these resources? Where can these people go to understand better what to do? What, you know, what, kind, of, um, what kind of resources are available to them? basically, and, and how can we, can we build stories around what people are doing? How can we identify positive, positively affirming those people who are making those shifts? Thank you so much, Tia. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so this will be to both of the panelists. What will be the driving force in persuading consumers that the circular economy is the future? Oh. Thank you, Erica. I'll kick off with an answer from us and then uh, I'll pass that on to Tia as well to add her bit, bearing in mind that we've literally got two minutes left. Um, <laughs> I, think that, I think that's a great uh, question. Um, the driving force of persuading consumers that the circular economy is the future. Um, really, I think, um, I know that the environmental aspect and climate change seems some, somewhat vague and a bit far into the future, even though we're beginning to see impacts of it. But I think that's one key uh, driver. The other is cost. Uh, as resources become more scarce, the cost of products is going to increase, and I think that will have quite an impact on consumers in terms of um, how, how they consume and how much they consume. Uh, but um, the real driver from, uh, for a uh, circular economy is building a, a sustainable future that offers stability. So um, if we, if we uh, look at the butterfly diagram again, in there, uh, what we will see is that it shows us uh, that um, the two cycles, uh, or rather uh, the two cycles that we've had, uh, one is the te technological one and one is the biological one. Um, that they, they clearly indicate uh, um, a future that is more sustainable uh, for the future generations, uh, particularly with uh, mind being mindful of population growth uh, and also the younger generations. Uh, the younger generations are very focused on um, 
a sustainable future, more so than the current generation. I'm sure you all noticed through your children how much they care about recycling. So I think consumer behavior is changing of its own uh, volition, and there's a role to play by all the stakeholders, at which point I will hand over to Tia for a few words before we close mm, on how we can that... get the different stakeholders engaged. I think um, when we talk about the future, it's such a sort of an ominous void, um, and I think it's really the human evolutionary step. It's about being curious, it's about collaborating so that we can share our learnings and upon which our, our learnings can actually develop into action items and to make those kind of commitments that will help us uh, get to that point. So yes, I believe in the sustainable development goals, but I also believe in actualizing our own learnings and to be you know, open to the next stages of what I feel will be our evolutionary step to survive. Thank you, Tia. Uh, that was very succinct uh, and right on time, bang on time. Um, we wanted to share with you uh, a few links to further reading materials, which will be which are available. Um, so um, we really wanted to thank you for your attention, for staying with us throughout. We haven't lost a single attendee. Well done, audience. We hope you found it useful. Um, I will hand over to uh, Erica for you to close off, please, and to provide people with information about where they can find the slides for the future and the recording. Thank you very much, Sandra. So a big thank you to our fantastic panelists, Sandra and Dia, and for to the audience who posted fantastic questions. Um, sorry we did not have time to answer all of them, uh, but thank you so much. So as Sandra mentioned, if you want to read more about the circular economy, please go ahead and visit our website, sustainabilityaction.com. We have posted a blog about this recently, so that's available for you there. And also the slides will be available on our website as well as the recording. And uh, additional information is also found, of course, on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's website and on Tia Kansara's website. Uh, as we do value your feedback, we hope you will take just a minute to answer our survey, which will be launched after we close this webinar. And you will also receive a link to the survey tomorrow in case you don't have time to do that now. Uh, our next webinar will take place on the 15th of June at 1 p.m. UA local time. And the topic will be the sustainability business case. Can a business case be made for sustainability and how? And the link for how to register for our next webinar will also be sent to you tomorrow. For any questions or inquiries, please don't hesitate to contact us at info at sustainabilitytaction.com. And now I'd like to wish you all a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you so much for your participation. And until next time, bye-bye.